What a better time to have the opportunity to be informed about clean energy by and from the Professor of Public Administration in International Affairs as it is related to en 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 environmental, economic, technology change, renewable energy. From Syracuse University and Maxwell's own David Pop, our guest speaker today. Remember what the man in the White House said about Paris and Pittsburgh. Let that annoy you a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But just a little bit. There are so many parts to this whole, ed whole clean energy that it's virtually impossible to grasp all the parts. From that person in the White House who wishes to abandon the United States partnership in a cleaner world to even those selfish followers and to us who choose to want clean energy world. We are very blessed to have Professor Pop today. Professor Pop comes to us with intense knowledge about wind power, solar power, and other alternate clean energy parts and concepts, and for sure, healthier substitutes that are evidence throughout the world. Everyone in this room, your children, your grandchildren, your friends, be they close or random, are or should be totally into clean energy and what it takes to attain that goal. A clean air, clean energy welcome to Professor David Pott. Thank you very much for having me here. So I'm gonna quickly hit the three points again. So the f first one is we have conflicting goals. Second one is we are gonna need to make some changes in the, ele the, ele the energy grid, the electricity systems, I'll talk about that. Third one is a long time frame. Um, the typical turnover time, people that are, you know, a company is thinking about building a new power plant, they're looking at a 30, 40 year time horizon, right? And so the changes that are going on in Washington where you have completely different policies from one administration to the next are very difficult for them. Right? And I'm gonna talk about that at the end, what, what that means for, the, for these companies. I wanna connect this to climate change as well. So we talked, we talked about Paris, I, I have to say, I was in Pittsburgh when Trump made the comment about Paris and Pittsburgh. And people in Pittsburgh were not happy about that either. Um, so, um, and they actually made the point that, you know, they're no longer a, you know, it's no longer a dirty city, it's no longer a city of coal miners. Um, and so they've been able to successfully change or kind of look at themselves as a success story. Um, for thinking about the climate change, the main issue is carbon emissions. For, um, the main source of carbon emissions is electricity. And so I'm gonna focus mostly on electricity today. That's where most of my research has been done. Um, deforestation and land use is the, next, is the next main source. So forests act as a sink absorbing carbon. When countries cut down those, when countries cut down the forest, right, there's less of a carbon sink, and so that has impact for emissions. Transportation is third. The goal is, um, that most scientists have is to keep carbon concentrations below 450 parts per million. Um, so this is designed to keep the temperature increase below two degrees Celsius. That's kind of the magic number that, um, that physical science scientists have come up with. Right now we're at about 400. So this is gonna require some very, very steep reductions. So this is a complicated graph. I'm just gonna kind of talk you through the main, the main points here. So this comes from, from the, the IPCC is the international body that does research on climate change. And this comes from their last report. Really the two things to focus on here. So this is looking at carbon emissions per, per year. And so this is, this is the path that we're on now. The different colors represent different, different levels of concentrations we want to meet. <coughs> the 450 is the blue down here. And so you'll see that within this is 2020 right here. And we need to start going down pretty much immediately. The energy cut emissions down about in half by, the, you know, by midway through the 21st century to be able to meet that goal. Now keep in mind, this is global, right? So this isn't saying just the US has to do this, it's saying the entire world has to do this. But at the same time that we're trying to make changes, we have countries like China and India and you know, the emerging economies, because emissions are still increasing because their countries are still developing. Right, which means that for Europe, Canada, the US, they have to do even more to be able to be on that pathway. To put that in perspective, this graph down here is the share of energy they would need to come from 
from low carbon sources. So this could be this could be renewables. This could be um, could potentially be. I don't think it includes biofuels, but it, it could be coal if, it's, if, it if it includes ways to capture the emissions, could include nuclear. Right now, the world is about 15%. By 2030, we'd want to increase that by about, to about 30, 25, 30%. 30 By 2050, they would need to get up to 60%. So we need to triple the amount of clean energy sources that we have between now and 2050. By the end of the 21st century, that's up to about 95%. Okay, so we have a long way to go to be able to get this to work. So with the technology we currently have, this is going to be really costly. I'll, I'll give some, some cost numbers later. Right? Um, but if we use a combination of energy policy and climate policy, our goals are to do two things. Right? We want to have things that encourage the use of more carbon-free technology today, to try, to try to encourage the deployment of that, but also to find ways to encourage more investment in new technology, more investment innovation, so we can get to a point where that world with 50, 60 percent renewables is going to be feasible, because there's still a lot of technological challenges to do that. Okay. So what am I do today? So three, three things I'm going to do with the talks. I'm going to start just like an overview of where energy comes from, just to get everybody up to speed about what kind of our, where we currently are getting energy from, and talk a little bit about natural gas and wind and solar, which are the which are the main clean technologies that are at least currently going to be viable. We'll talk about then the role of policy, how policy can help to promote those technologies, and then finally end by moving forward. So, what are the changes in Washington mean, and you know, what's going on in the U.S.? Okay. So, where does energy come from? So. This, this one's kind of fun, just kind of see the complexity of it, have a simpler graph afterwards, but what this looks at is we have outputs here. So we use energy in the residential sector, commercial, industry, transportation. This takes us through to see which energy sources go where. So petroleum goes to transportation and industry. Coal mostly goes to electricity generation, and then electricity gets sorted out between residential, commercial, and industrial. Natural gas gets used in all three. Nuclear, the renewables, they tend to go almost entirely to electricity generation. So there's lots of different sources being used. Obviously, it's going to depend on, on, on which sector is using it. With it, electricity, coal, natural gas, and then nuclear and renewables are, are the, main, the main sources. What's the gray? <coughs> Great question. The gray box is what happens to all this. So you'll notice that there's a little less than 100, 100 quads of energy used. So we can kind of basically take these percentages. Useful outputs, energy services, is about 40%, 38.4. The gray box is rejected energy. So what rejected energy is, so when you, so the way to think of these is when you use your car, you drive your car, the energy service is you burn the, you burn the gasoline and it makes the car go. That's the service that's provided. The engine also gets hot. Right? There's heat that's just wasted. That's the rejected energy. Right? So about, about, two, you know, about a two to one ratio here. Right? A lot of the energy that's used isn't actually providing a useful service. It's just wasted. Right? You think about, for, exa for example, you know, nuclear power plants are by Lake Ontario, right? They're by Lake Ontario because they require a lot of water for cooling. Right? So this is one of the things actually that you know, some of the newer technologies are trying to do. So, so the, the, new, the newest gas, um, gas turbines will actually reuse that waste heat. So it's, a, it's called a combined cycle plant. So they burn the gas and then rather than just exhaust the heat, capture the heat and use, the, use that to heat water and the steam also produces electricity. So try to make use of some of, some of that. Mm -hmm. right? So, to be a simpler presentation of this, I just kind of break down the numbers. So, where does our, you know, where, where does our energy come from? I did, that was kind of dark to see. It. Coal is about 16 percent, natural gas 29 percent, petroleum 36 percent, nuclear nine, renewables 10 percent. If you look at renewables, renewable is a lot of that is hydro is a quarter, electric fair amount in New York. But a lot of that's biomass. Um, so waste. So in Ada County, we have the trash incinerator. 
Uh, but biofuels and wood, so very traditional sources, not necessarily ones that would be pollution free. Wind and solar are a lot, a, a much smaller share of that. This is just for electricity, but just to give you a sense of what it looks like for New York, unlike a lot of the Midwest, other parts of the country, New York uses very little coal. So the black here is coal, and you can see in the last 10 years, that's almost disappeared. Fair amount of natural gas, Hydro is a little bit bigger than it is in some other areas of the country. The light green is other renewables, and a fair amount of nuclear. Um, so New York, that's one of the reasons that our electricity bills are a little higher in New York. We have a fair amount of, of nuclear power. We'll talk a bit about, about that as we go through as well. When you're talking about clean energy, do we get any extra brownie points for locally producing the energy that we're using? Do you get extra brownie points for locally producing? And by um, brownie points, you mean a reduction in rate? Right, so if a percentage of our stuff is um, natural gas, does that mean, is that a little less bad for New York because we're producing it ourselves, so there's no extra carbon used in transporting it? Um, not much because it's, cause most of it's being transported by pipelines. Um, so it depends on how it's transported. So, I, so um, and there's been this big debate about, about the Keystone Pipeline. You know, one thing I'd point out about the Keystone Pipeline is that that oil is still getting to the market. What they're doing on now is they're putting in on train cars. Right? There's, and I remember about five years ago there was an accident in Quebec where the, the train cars actually <coughs> ran to the city. All right, so in that sense, the pipeline is, is, is actually is actually a better option than than the alternative. Um, but most of the natural gas can come through the pipeline, so there's not, so not going to be a big benefit to getting it, um, getting it locally. Yeah. So I do want to talk about natural gas. Um, natural gas is, is, is really important here. Natural gas is often seen as kind of a bridge between kind of the old traditional fuels of, of using coal for electricity and renewables. Right? So it's not as clean as, as, as wind or solar, but compared to coal, these new power plants, these new combined cycle plants that I was talking about, 60% less carbon dioxide, 80 to 90 percent less nitrogen dioxide and very little particulate matter or sulfur dioxide. So they are a lot cleaner. Hydrofracking has increased supplies. This is lower cost. Um, so this is looking at what's happened in the U.S. over the last 20, 30 years. Crude reserves. So how much natural gas do we have? The ability of fracking means we have more that is now feasible to actually get out of the ground. So that you see that big increase comes around 2006, 2007. Production's also gone up. Imports were never that big, so it's, not hard, it's hard to see, but imports have been going down as production has been going up. As a result of this, costs have fallen. So natural gas prices started to go up in the early 2000s at the end of the IT boom, and then really have, have gone down steadily since then. Right. So as a result of this, these lower costs mean that more power plants are using natural gas. So last year was the first year in which natural gas, rather than coal, was the main source of U.S. electricity. We'll come back later to the current political situation. This is important to keep in mind when Trump talks about saving the coal miners' jobs, because gas is a big part of this. So you'll notice, I may say, here, here's the increase. As gas is going up, coal is going down. It is true the renewables are going down a little bit, but they're really I mean, going up a little bit. That's just at the end here, but most of that decrease in coal is not driven by wind and solar. It's driven by natural gas. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there are some environmental issues, though. So it's, it's on the plus side, it's helped to reduce U.S. carbon emissions. <clears throat> so the blue, the blue bar here is what to focus on. This is the annual percentage increase or decrease in carbon emissions big decrease during the, the recession, 2009 to so 2010, went back up a little bit, but for the most part, since fracking started, we've had, we've, every year we've had a little less carbon emissions than we had the year before. So the U.S. is actually reducing emissions primarily because of natural gas. <coughs> on the downside, there are concerns about impact of fracking on water. Um, what does it mean for surface pollution? What does it mean for groundwater pollution? Groundwater pollution in particular can be very difficult for the science because it's hard to identify you know, what the particular source of the pollution is. Um, there's some concerns about some of the emissions that may come from the fracking process itself. Um, so obviously you need energy to get it out of the ground. So there's some trade-offs here. Um, so it's not, you know, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a silver bullet, there is no silver bullet. Um, but definitely seems to be cleaner than coal would be. 
isn't natural gas a, a relatively potent uh, greenhouse gas? So it's different. So it's, it's an interesting question. So the potency is through methane. So, so one of the issues with, with, the, with the greenhouse gases is the timing of that. So the methane has a bigger impact in global temperature, but it's a short-lived impact. Right? The challenge with carbon is that carbon stays in the atmosphere for a couple hundred years. So the carbon we're gonna be, that we're putting in today is still going to be part of the problem at the end of the century. Right, so we think of, so for example, we think of natural gas as, as a rich fuel, right? If we can get to that point where we get to 60 to 70% renewables, right, the methane won't be having an impact anymore because it has a much, it has a much, it has, it, has a, it has a bigger impact in temperature but a faster impact. Whereas the carbon is a much, is a much more long lived impact and that's why we feel concerned more about carbon. Right? You look at wind and solar, wind in particular has become very cost competitive. So this is the cost of wind over the last 20 years, it's fallen dramatically. And as a result of that, you'll see this is the amount of wind that's been installed in the US. As those costs have gone down, installations have gone up. Um, so we definitely have been seeing increases in wind. <coughs> Solar's more expensive, the costs are falling. So the US has had this, under the Obama administration, had this program called the Sunshot Program, which was designed to reduce the cost of solar. So this is residential commercial and for electric utilities. So the red is where they were when the program started. The green is where they are in 2016, and then the, the blue and the yellow are their goals for 2020 and 2030. So it's gone down a lot as a result of this program. Obviously this program's not gonna continue, presumably, during the Trump administration. Um, still, I'll have some more graphs in a little bit. Not exact, not competitive yet with wind or with, with natural gas, but. It's still trending in the right direction, but there's still, there's still work to be done. Issues for expanding renewables. So the first thing is just, do we have enough good sites? And what does it mean to be a good site? Right? We need to have sufficient winds. It has to be a windy site. It has to be a sunny site. You want to where the energy is demanded. Right? As you tr if, if the longer that you, the longer that you transmit the energy over the, over you know the, the really big the really big power lines. There's transmission losses. Right? This actually is a bit of a challenge. Right? The best wind resources in the US are in the Midwest, so you get in the Dakotas and Nebraska. Right? But there's not a big population base there. I mean, a lot, some of that gets shipped to Chicago, but there's some transmission losses along the way. And they have to not be ruled out politically. I mean, we see that in New York State. You know, people have debates about do we want to have windmills in our backyards. And the other challenge is the intermittent nature. Right? It's energy storage is important. We can't control when the wind blows. We can't control when the sun's going to shine. Right? So that has impacts. That has impact how we're going to integrate the grid. And so because of that, it's more challenging to put these sources onto electrical grid. So I wanted to do just a quick overview of how the electric grid works to kind of understand what these challenges are. Right? So the first thing that's important here is electricity can't be stored. Right? What goes on the grid has to come off the grid and it has to come off almost immediately, right? And so what happens, so this is where natural gas actually plays an important role. Natural gas plants are easier to turn on and off than the coal plants. So we, the coal plants are what are called base load plants. So when the coal plant's running, this is the same for nuclear as well, the idea is you wanna run that 24 hours a day because it's costly to shut it down and start it back up again. The natural gas plants, they're a little easier to turn on and off, so it gives a little more flexibility. You know, so they can be turned off when the sun's shining on a hot on a hot day, and then turned back on at night to balance things out. There are balancing authorities then that ensure the demand and supply are, are always met. So in New York, this is the New York Independent System Operators, a NISO, and there's a bunch of these. Are, there's 60, 68, I believe, 66 in the country. So the circles are the various balancing authorities. The different colors represent kind of the different grids. So the eastern half of the U.S. is connected. The western is connected. Texas is its own little grid. These connections are important. I mean, so it can be for good or bad. So remember the, the big black that we had in the early 2000s actually started in Ohio. But all these systems are connected. So once again, what happened there is a big transmission line went down. The power plants had to shut down because the power wasn't coming off quickly enough. Remember, everything that goes on has to come off. It couldn't come off, so that shut, that shut them down. As more things shut down, just kind of cascaded throughout the entire system. Okay. 
So we think about electricity sources, we think about things that are dispatchable, so things that the operator can control when they're gonna be on and off, the natural gas I told you about, versus intermittent, right? things that the operator is at, it's at the whims of nature. Right? So wind, is, wind and solar are gonna be at the wind, whims of nature. Right? This is actually makes it very challenging. And one of the big challenges here is that the marginal cost of wind and solar is essentially zero. Okay, so what does that mean? Right? There's a cost to build, there's a capital cost, there's an upfront cost to building a wind turbine or building a, a, a solar panel. But once you've built it, the energy's free. You're not paying for natural gas, you're not paying for something to use to burn it. Okay? So all they have to do is get their capital cost back. Right? And so when the sun, when you have a really sunny day or a really windy day, that power needs to go on the grid. They have essentially no cost to generate that power. So the way this balancing authority works is the power plants put in a bid for how much do they want to sell their electricity for. They can bid pretty close to zero. They can bid zero because they also get subsidies. So they'll make money on the subsidy if they bid zero. That prices the other sources out of the market. Um, so these prices really range widely. Um, so I'm going to show a graph that so they vary, vary by a factor of 10 or more. Um, California is where this has been the biggest problem. California has actually experienced some, some times in the, la in the last year during the day when the price of electricity, the wholesale price was negative because the, power, the wind and solar are getting subsidies so they can produce, I mean, if their subsidy is five cents, they can pay you two cents to take it, they'll still take money. But also the bigger power plants, they're, it, and for the ones like coal, where it's gonna be costly to start back up again, if there's a spike, and if there's a time of the day which is really sunny, they would pay somebody to take the electricity so they can keep the plant running, mm -hmm. rather than have the cost of shutting down and having to start back up again. So this is what's known as the duck curve. <laughs> See why it's known as the duck curve? <laughs> These are the typical, the typical electricity needs from the grid in the state of California. So the state of California has made this big push towards solar energy. They had this program called the Million Solar Roofs. And so this is where they were in 2012, where it was kind of flat, level during the day, people using a little more electricity during the work day, and then electricity used to ramp up at night. People get home, they turn the lights on, they're doing their laundry, they're cooking, and so on. Right? But back in 2012, it was kind of flat, and then went up. But what's happened now is that all these homes having solar, right, there's less need. So this, each year, as this goes down, 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, right, the need for power from the grid keeps going down during the day. Right? This is where you're getting those negative prices. Right? Where, you know, here's one, this was projected for 2020, but this is an actual plot here from May 15th, 2016, which is even below that, just for 2020. So there's so little electricity needed, this is why you're getting the negative prices. Right? And this is making it very challenging for the traditional power plants to stay in business because they're competing with what's essentially a free source. But keep in mind that we need those plants, right? This is, this is the challenge. We can't just say, well, let's just use solar because if we say, well, let's just use solar, we've got nothing here in the evening when the demand is highest and the sun has gone down, right? So the challenge is making those plants economically viable at the same time we bring these into the grid. Right? And until we can come up with, with a, cheaper, a cheap way to store electricity, right, this is gonna be a big challenge. And this has been an issue in New York State. Yep. Um, don't, uh, don't power plants charge you a sort of a rated price for when you use electricity to peak hours and not peak hours? Some do, some don't. Um, I'll, I think I have some of this later. Texas actually has a, uh, one Texas utility offers a plan where you can get electricity for free at night. Because there's a lot of wind in Texas. The wind blows higher at night, and so they're trying to get cur encourage people to wait till nine o'clock to turn their stuff on. Um, so some do, a lot of the industry gets that. It, it, it varies for, you know, different, different companies offer different things, but that is, that is a possibility, yes. Um, yep? Is there any uh, advanced battery or other storage technology that uh, is on a horizon somewhere that could partially address the situation um, for storage? So, there, so there's two questions, so there's two ways to think about it. So there's the, you want to look at this on the engineering side and the economic side. So in engineering, yes. Um, I know Tesla's been working on big batteries. Um, there are a couple, you know, there are other couple of companies working on this as well. So the engineering is there. Um, the challenge is cost. It's just right now, the, it's, you know, if you look at that cost, the graph that it had for wind, 
they're still at the top of that cost curve. Right? So there's a lot of work that needs to be done to, to get moved down that cost curve. Um, so they're out there. What we tend to see now is you don't see a lot of use of batteries. Um, what, you t what you tend to see for storage are places, and this isn't, doesn't work as well in the US, um, the, the main storage source right now is called pumped hydro. Um, so you see this in Europe. Um, so Germany also uses a lot of solar and a lot of wind. Their grid is connected to the Scandinavian countries. And what will happen is if they're producing a lot of solar or energy, they can send electricity to the Scandinavian country, countries. They can use that to pump, they have a lot of hydro in, in the Scandinavian countries, they can use that to pump the water uphill. And then at, at night when the sun stops shining, you let that water flow downhill, runs a hydro dam, and so places where you have that geography you could use that. So that's, that's the primary storage method that's used now. There's a couple other things like that as well. So batteries are out there, it's just a matter of getting the, getting the cost down to a point where they're going to be competitive. Yeah. So I know the guys, the Tesla guys, yep. building a $5 billion battery plant right. in Nevada. Right. Well, if and when that happens, the cost should balance down. It should help bring it down, but there, there's, you know, my understanding is there's still a ways to go to get to get the cost down. But yeah, you know, we're back. If we think of bat, if we think of batteries as being up here on the cost curve, moving down is good, so we can be here rather than here. But we still got a ways to go to get down to here. And the last point I want to make is that this. This has been, and the solar certainly isn't as big in New York, so it's, it hasn't, we haven't faced quite the challenges of California. But if you heard the news about subsidies for nuclear power, yeah, so this is about, you know, there's the threat of the Fitzpatrick and Nine Mile point plant in Oswego County being closed. Governor stepped in, they've added, added a, a surcharge for your bill to cover the cost of nuclear. It's for the same reason, right? As, wind, as partially wind, partially natural gas being cheaper, it's been made very difficult for the nuclear plants to stay in business. But the nuclear plants, remember you saw before, they're our main source of base load power. We don't have, we have very little coal in New York. Those are the plants that stay on 20, 20, 24 hours a day, and so there are some risks to having them all shut down, so there's some reason to want to be able to keep them around. So let me turn now to the role of policy. So this, is, this is where most of my research has been. So we have, we, said we, need, we need continued innovation, right? We need to develop new storage technologies. We need to develop new ways to manage the grid. i has been talking about having micro grids, for example, so having th things that are on a smaller scale, so the balancing issues are as complicated. Um, we want to potentially come up with technologies we haven't even thought of yet, so I call breakthrough technologies here. But all this innovation isn't going to happen without some policy support. So why is that? So the main concept that we talk about in economics is the idea of externalities. So the idea of externality is your activity, you know, driving a car, a firm producing something, causes some pollution. And that harms your neighbor, but doesn't necessarily have any impact on yourself. Right? And so unless that cost is incorporated into your decision, you're not going to worry about it. Right? So we think of this as, you know, um, as, you know you think of uh, public health as you think of this as secondhand smoke, right? So how does your smoking affect the other people in the room? Okay. So the idea is that unless there's something that forces firms, forces drivers to take into account these actions, they won't be part of the decision-making process, which means not only is there less incentive to use the cleaner technologies, there's little incentive for firms to develop the cleaner technologies. Because why am I going to invest you know, the upfront money in R&D to something there's not going to be a market for? So this is what environmental policy aims to do. And so the idea here is we say the social costs of energy are greater than the private costs. Okay, and so here's an example of this. This is a study that was done a few years ago that looks at the social costs of generating electricity. So this here, these are just the, the private costs. So you gotta set aside here, these are existing coal, and coal, gas, and nuclear plants. The cost of building a new coal plant New natural gas plant, it depends on the type of plant that it is. So is it one of the ones that can be turned on and off quickly or would it be more of a base load plant? A new nuclear plant, wind and solar. 
and you'll see the existing source of the cheapest. If you just look at the private costs, coal is a little cheaper than wind, natural gas is cheaper than wind, nuclear even then is a little expensive just because of the capital cost of starting up a nuclear plant. And now let's add the environmental costs. So the red includes what are called non-carbon as general costs. And I haven't think about climate change yet, but just thinking about the harm for the particulates and sulfur dioxide and so on. Notice as you do that, like, the environmental cost of coal is a lot higher than natural gas, so the difference between coal and gas gets much larger. Compare it to wind now, even with that thing about carbon costs, wind now looks cheaper than coal. Solar is still more expensive. Mm -hmm. The green then adds on the carbon cost on top of that, and you'll see that you know, coal becomes even worse. Right? And so natural gas is a little bit of carbon cost, so compared to wind, wind's still a little bit higher. But there are places, you know, if you're in a windy enough location, so to say, in, in, in Texas or the Midwest, for example, where wind would actually be the, cheap, the cheapest source to use, because this is going to vary a little bit by location. So natural gas and wind almost on par. So this is the goal of environmental policy, right? The idea of the policy is to take those social costs into account, to find a way to make people pay those costs. Okay. So there's two kind of main sets of policies that we look at, and so I'll kind of give you a quick overview. So what are called command and control policies are just setting a specific target, it's basically telling somebody what to do. So you have a, when you buy a car, there's a, a fuel efficiency rating on that. Uh, and the car companies have to meet what are called CAFE standards. Right? So they have they, they're, the average fuel economy of all the cars they sell has to meet a certain target. <coughs> Energy efficiency standards. The government says that you know, that your refrigerator has to meet a certain standard. Right? So the idea of having specific standards, specific things you have to be able to do. The alternative is what are called market-based policies. Market-based policies are based on the idea of social cost. If we can essentially incorporate that social cost into the price, we can get people to consider the full cost of the activity. Right? So the, the best known of this is what's called a carbon tax. Right? So I don't know how you've heard this in the news, so carbon tax hasn't really been talked about much in the US, it is being used elsewhere. Um, so been, I did some work in Canada last year, several of the Canadian provinces now have a carbon tax. The idea of a carbon tax, it is a tax that's based on the carbon content of the fuel. So the tax for coal would be higher than the tax for natural gas, which goes back to that graph we had before, that the social cost of coal is higher than the social cost of gas. Once you've added that in, that makes natural gas look cheaper, makes coal more expensive. So we see this happening in some places. One of the advantages of a carbon tax is that it provides some revenue for the government. Um, so actually the, there was a proposal by, by some former Republican administrators, I think James Baker was one of the people on it, that came out in February, to propose a carbon tax for the U.S. as part of a bigger tax reform. And the idea is that money then could be used to lower taxes on other things in the economy, lower taxes on investment, lower taxes on labor. And you know, the way to think of it is placing a tax on something that is undesirable, the pollution, rather than taxing things that we want to have, people working, people investing. The other alternative was, was called cap and trade. So this one you may have heard in the news because it actually was talked about in the US back at the beginning of the Obama administration. <coughs> cap and trade kind of combines both of these. So it starts by setting a target. We're not gonna let emissions go above a certain level. And then what happens is the way that target is met is we give each firm a permit that allows them, so let's, let's say our goal is to cut emissions in half. So, and say a plant currently has 100 tons of emissions we give them 50 permits, they're allowed to emit 50 tons, so they have to reduce by half. But the trade part is that firms then can buy and sell these permits with, with each other. So if a firm thinks they can do a better job, they can sell the permits to somebody else. If they have a really, you know, so a newer, a newer, more efficient plant might decide, I don't need these permits, I can reduce pollution more, they can sell it to an older plant, right? That allows an older plant to stay in business. That lowers the total cost of complying with, with the policy bill because the ones that have the cheapest cost, the ones that can do the most to reduce pollution, end up doing most of the work. Right? And by trading, they don't bear all the costs. Essentially, the dirtier plants pay some of the costs for them. 
right? Way to think of it basically is saying that the older plan says that I'll pay you to, to help beat my target rather than do it on my own because it's cheaper for me to pay you. That's the idea of cap and trade. So again, this, this actually was used in the U.S. not for, for carbon but for sulfur dioxide. So there was a market that was started in the mid-1990s. Um, New York actually has a cap and trade for climate. They'll talk about it. It doesn't really do much. Uh, the cap is pretty much non-binding, but it is on the books. Um, Europe does this now. It also hasn't had a big impact. Um, I think the European market was well-intentioned, but it went in place right before the financial crisis, and so emissions fell because of that. Emissions, when emissions fell, people didn't need to buy the permits, and so the market almost collapsed. They've had to prop it up a couple times. Canada has um, also has some provinces. Ontario has started a cap-and-trade program, um, so they actually auction off the permits and then use the money to support investment in green technology. Um, so you see, you see this starting to spread as well. So as I mentioned a little bit, economists tend to prefer the market-based regulation. And two reasons for that. One is that flexibility matters, right? The example I gave with the trading. And the flexibility allows people to pick the cheapest way to do things. Right? It incorporates the cost into the decision making and you can decide how much is this how much does this cost mean to me. Right? So the, the the people that have the most ability to reduce pollution will do most of the work. That's gonna be the cheapest way to meet the community's goals. Mm -hmm. The other thing is it provides rewards for continual improvement. There's always a reward to be better. So this is a graph from a paper that I wrote about. I mentioned there was a sulfur dioxide market in the US. So this is a paper I wrote about almost 14 years ago now. It looks at, so what's on the, on the y-axis here, this is the, the efficiency of scrubbers. So power, power plants will clean up sulfur dioxide emissions by putting a scrubber on the plant. And this is how much sulfur dioxide does that scrubber remove. The bars here represent different policy regimes. So the important ones here are the last two. So in the 1977 Clean Air Act, passed a regulation that said scrubbers had to install, excuse me, power plants had to install a scrubber and had to meet a certain efficiency standard. They, they did this because there were some, um, some of the senators from the coal states were concerned that people might stop using coal. So it's basically what they said, you're gonna keep using coal, you're just gonna clean it up. Right? And you'll see the result of that. Right? You tell somebody they have to do something, they do it. Right? The efficiency of the scrubbers pretty much is flat that entire period. Right? You're gonna pay the cost to comply with the regulation, but there's no reason to go above and beyond. There's no reason to do any better than what the government tells you to do. The 1990 Clean Air Act, this is 1990 here, introduced permit trading. Now there's a bit of a phase in period, so the permits didn't actually have to be in place until 1995. They had some initial markets in 93 and 94 to, to get it started. But you'll see what happens is as those markets go in place, 93, 94, 95, now the, the efficiency of the scrubber that's being installed is higher. Right? And what's going on here is that because you have these permits, there's a reward for doing better. Right? If, I, if I do more than required, I can cash in, I can sell my permits, I can make money off them. The government was giving these permits to companies for free. Right? Mm -hmm. So you could, use, you could use the permit, basically there's no cost to you, but there's an opportunity cost. Right? If I pollute, I lose the chance to cash in on this. Right, so some firms were choosing to install a more efficient scrubber and, and cash in. <coughs> not everybody did this, not everybody sold scrubber. You know, some people had a, there was a market for these, somebody was buying these permits. Other firms didn't bother with scrubbers at all. Um, they, they would use, turn to cleaner coal, so they would change the coal they were using because some coal has less sulfur than others. So there was flexibility, firms found different ways to meet the goals, but there was incentive to try to find better ways, ways we weren't using before. Right? So that's one of the advantages of these flexible programs. So thinking about that and the goals of policies, the first thing you notice is that, is that environmental policy is not only going to increase the use of the clean technologies today, right? it's not just making it cheaper to use natural gas versus coal, it also creates incentives to develop new technologies. Right? People aren't going to invest in new technologies unless there's a market for them. Right? So this, this is one of my favorites, this is, this is one of those where a, a picture, a, one picture tells the entire story. So this is looking at the share of innovation. With these, what these researchers did is they looked at patents in different countries and look at what percentage of patents were things that were related to clean climate technologies. The black line 
are the countries that ratified the Kyoto Protocol. So the Kyoto Protocol was before Paris, that was, that was the, previous, the previous climate treaty. So Annex 1 countries are the ones that actually had to reduce emissions as part of the Kyoto Protocol. Everybody except the U.S. ratified, all those countries except the U.S. ratified it. Um, Australia was in and then pulled out, so Australia changed, but the U.S. was the only one that was never, that never ratified it. And what you notice, the Kyoto Protocol is 1998. The countries that ratified more, more research on clean technologies. The U.S. didn't ratify. Line stays the same. The other, if you're just curious, the other dashed line is China. China wasn't required to meet any emission reductions, but they've, there's been a lot of increased innovation in China just at everything over the last few years. Um, but the big difference here really is the difference between the countries that were in the treaty versus not. Right? Again, the policy, policy forces people to find ways to do better. One of the challenges here, though, is think about how we develop some of these longer term technologies. So what do we do about batteries? What do we do to get the cost of solar down? Okay. And so it's worth thinking about whether just having a market-based policy in place is enough. Right? So it's just a carbon tax or cap and trade going to be enough. And so there's actually a more subtle way to think of this. So instead of just thinking about market-based versus command and control versus flexible versus telling people what to do, you can think of policies that are technology neutral versus technology specific. So a carbon tax is a cap and trade, um, a renewable portfolio standard. So, so New York has a target that I think it's 15% of electricity needs to be from renewables. Those are all technology neutral. Like whether we use hydro, whether we use wind, whether we use solar, doesn't matter as long as the utility is using some renewables. Right? The alternative are things that are technology specific. So we can have investment subsidies or you know, there's a production tax credit that's in place for wind and for solar. What's called a feed-in tariff. So Germany, Germany has been one of the leaders in developing solar. So you may think we can't use solar in New York, but it's, no, it's, no, it's not much sunnier in Germany than it, than it is here. Um, we can take, you know, there's a lot of debate whether it made sense for Germany to be a leader in solar, but they did. What the feed-in tariff is, is it's a guaranteed price. Okay? So you make an investment in a, a, renewable, a, a renewable plant, whether it's wind or, or solar, they guarantee you're going to get a certain price for electricity for the next 10 years. And it's a higher price than the market price for electricity. Okay. In particular, they said, remember I showed you those graphs before, how much higher solar was. Mm -hmm. The price that was guaranteed for solar was about five or 10 times higher than the price guaranteed for wind to make up for the fact that wind was so costly. And so because of that, there was a lot of investment in solar. Okay. So this is a debate that you'll hear a lot in the news. And so you'll see that you'll see this term in the debates, you know, should the government pick winners? Okay. Well, one of the points I want to make is that th the decision to let the market pick a winner is also picking a winner. Because if we leave it to the market, this is some research I did with a couple of colleagues in Europe, if we leave it to the market, you're going to pick the cheapest technology. So countries that you just had a renewable energy mandate, they said you have to have 20% renewables. They all chose wind because wind was, when we go back to our graph before, wind was the cheapest renewable source. The only country where you see solar being used is where there's a guaranteed price. And so there's a trade off here. If we want to keep the cost as low as possible, we want the market to pick winners. But Germany has a lot of solar, they also have really high utility bills because solar does cost more. Right. So as they try out between keeping the cost as low as we can in the short run, letting the market be flexible and picking the cheapest technology now, versus setting some specific targets for you know, picking winners in a sense, saying, saying we want to have a certain amount come from solar, we want to have a certain amount come from wind and so on. But having less flexibility and so letting the costs go up. Because those costs the utilities have are going to be passed on somewhere. Right. So what can we do about this? So, a couple of policies that I want to talk about. One is that we can combine kind of the broad-based policies so we can have a carbon tax, we can have cap and trade, but make some use of subsidies to help those technologies that are furthest from the market. Right? So we can have the carbon tax, that might be enough to get wind involved, then we can add a second subsidy if we want to see more solar. Right? We can also focus on government R&D. 
right? So we can focus on rather than having firms do the investment, let the firms work on things that are close to the market. Let the government, let the universities work on things that are further from the market and bring those costs, bring those costs down. Yep. Were you talking about government uh, R&D? Mm -hmm. You need the money. So when you get the money, where you come from? I said, my person looks like the government is supposed to tax the wind and the solar energy the percent. The reason is this. When you generate or create in one, one way and you are hurt, Give an example like this. When a company spend a lot of money to invest technology to get it robotical, lo the process, you know what? Who get hurt? Me and you. Why? Because they don't need the person operation the, the, the factory anymore. So we all lose a job and we don't have anything to eat. So in that situation, when we use the solar and the wind power, it's cheap because this is a God give us. No, no charge. But question is, you create the competition prices, you kill other possibility, the way to create the new <coughs> technology. Give an example like this. If one day, and we can invent the car, and we don't need a gasoline, we only put the water in there, that's a winner, because we get a lot of water in the North America. How about Saudi? Saudi will get poor. Why? Because they don't have the water. So do we need to encourage scientists to develop the way to think in that direction? For example, Actually, like this, solar energy that like you're talking about, it depends on the weather, I agree. Yeah. But the question is, you know, I personally feel it looks like they have the best way to do it. If we had a missile to, each, to, to launch 100 pounds, the power plant go around the sun, coming back and store this energy and we can provide a lot of the city. We can launch thousands, thousands of the, the missile. So I will say, no one, no one has thought of that. I will say that, uh, I can't remember yeah. who did. I have seen, but before people think this is all just pie in the sky, I have seen plans, and I don't know whether anybody actually tends to use it, for wind turbines that essentially would be launched two or three miles up. You basically would put the wind turbine up in every atmosphere, you would tether it to the ground and deliver the power down that way. Um, I have no idea how you mark the line and make sure the airplanes don't get in the way, but I have some of that. Um, but let me come back to the, one second, let me come back to the, I think the crux of your question really was about employment. And I think that's, it's, it's actually a really important question. I, it's a really important question, and I'll talk more about it at the end of the talk when I talk about the politics, because that's a lot of what's happened over the last couple of years. You know, the, Trump, the Trump administration has come into power because there are people who felt their voices weren't, weren't being heard. Um, you know, I think there's two things to keep in mind. One is that whether the government makes these investments or whether the private sector makes these investments, you're not going to stop technology. The government can maybe shape the direction technology goes, but innovation is going to happen right? because, I mean, you, you gave the example of people losing their job because you know, we have solar, we don't need to have people working to, to drill oil, right? We also have companies working on driverless cars. We don't need taxi drivers. We don't need truck drivers. There's, no, there's not a lot of government support behind that. That's coming out of the private sector, right? So a lot of this stuff's going to happen anyway. Um, what's important to keep in mind are two things, right, is there's always churn in the economy. And so one issue is, in, in what ways can people be reemployed? You know, so if there's less coal, what's going to happen? Um, and the news here is good for some, not good for others. This is actually a question I'm working on with a couple, with a couple of colleagues. We're looking at the Department of Labor does a survey that re says what skills are required for each job. So we compare the skills that are required for green jobs, the jobs that might be developed because of clean energy policies, to the rest of the economy, and then what we call brown jobs, so things in energy extraction and so on. In general, actually, the news is pretty good that the green jobs, the skills in the green jobs generally look closer to the skills in the brown jobs than everything else. The way to think of this is that you need some, you, know, you need an electrical engineer whether you're working on a coal plant or whether you're working, you know, whether you're working on, whether you're working on solar. So there's, there's, some, there's some similarities there. The downside is for the people, this actually goes back to the Trump supporters. It's kind of the, the lower income, less educated, the max, you know, the, the biggest distance the biggest gap between the skill requirement are her people in the oil and energy extraction industries. But so that is one where it's more difficult to find a, more difficult to find a job. Right? But 
as I'll talk about later, it's not, it hasn't just been renewables that's caused those jobs to go away. So I mean, one thing to think about is education, retraining. What, what, do, what do we do to, get, to help these people find something else? And I think it's important that the government does keep that in mind. And we'll come back to that a little more. They're talking with another hand. Relating to nuclear energy, have you heard about uh, Leslie Dewan and her fellow MIT nuclear physicists who have developed a nuclear power plant that runs on spent fuel and it has a system in it so that it cannot melt down? I saw something about a plant that used less fuel. I'm not sure if that's they the same one or not, but yeah, I'm not sure if that's the same one. Um, and we have millions that, of tons of spent fuel. Mm -hmm. That would be, I mean, so if you go back to the breakthrough innovations, that would be a big breakthrough innovation, right? Um, because that would, one of the biggest problems with nuclear is nuclear waste. I don't know, again, I don't know what the costs of that are. I mean, the, that's always the challenge for these, is there's the engineering, and then there's a, how do you get it, how do you get it down to cost? Um, but that would, that would be an example of one of those breakthrough technologies that really would be a game changer. Yeah. Senator, uh, he mentioned about maybe it's a fusion power plant. Because the fusion power plant, you had a difficulty because it mm -hmm. cannot come Mm -hmm. because that energy is too high, and if you cannot control, and you will turn into another kind of meltdown, you get fixed. Yeah, so there's not a sound in the sky. Yeah, so lots, so, so lots of technology challenges that, that, that are still out there, so I think, is, is kind of the key message from this. And that's and again, that goes back to, you know, the, I'm, you know the, you're thinking about the, kind of the role of government, the MIT work, I'm sure, would have been supported by government R&D, I mean, the stuff being done at universities, right? And so that's the kind of the role of the government is to do some of those things that are farther from the market and then get them to a place where we're able to potentially make them commercial. Okay. I want to spend a little bit on each of these policies. So for subsidies, I mean, subsidies are always very popular politically. You know, politicians love to give people money better than to, I mean, nobody talks about a carbon tax, that's taking money away, but giving people a subsidy to buy a hybrid car, giving people a subsidy to put solar panels on the home. That's, that's always politically popular. People like, government likes that. I want to be careful about that, though. So they're less efficient, right? And one of the reasons they're less efficient is, <coughs> you mentioned before, the, the tax brings money in to the government. And we can use that, that money to lower taxes somewhere else. Or we can use it to spend it on something else we need. The subsidy requires the government to raise taxes somewhere else, because that money has to come from somewhere. Right? So there's an added cost to the subsidy. Right? Even if it's just a tax credit, I think this is important to keep in mind. Right? Tax credits are a cost, right? because a tax credit is money not coming into the government. Right? So you need to pay for that either by cutting spending or by raising taxes somewhere else. The, you know, so I think you know, there's some use for subsidies to get some experience, market experience with some of these cutting edge technologies, because we learn a lot by having the technology being used. Right, so after we actually use them, we see the challenge of integrating with the grid, we see what works and what doesn't. So we want to have some of this out there. We want to be careful, though, about spending money on things that people might do on their own. Right? So, I mean, you can, get a, you can get a tax credit for buying a hybrid, but how many people buying that would have bought that hybrid anyway? Right? If, if they would have bought it anyway, then it's just, that's wasted money, essentially. The other problem is that these subsidies go to people who are generally very well off. Right? So here's a graph from a study done by researchers at UC Berkeley. So what this does, this is different adjusted gross incomes for households in different bids. So from 0 to 10,000, 10 to 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 75,000, 75 to 200,000, 200,000 and above. The gray bars are the percentage of households that are in each bid. So roughly equal distribution at the lower levels, only 3% that are in the really rich above 200,000. The two blue bars, light blue is the test credits for electric vehicles, the dark blue are test credits for residential energy credits, so putting on um, so energy efficiency investments or putting in solar panels and so on. And what you see here is right, poor people are basically taking none of those. Right? They're not going out and buying new cars. They probably don't have a house to put the solar panels on, so none of that benefit's going to them. 3% of households have income $200,000 or above. 35% of the tax credits for electric vehicles go to those 3% of the households. 54% go to the 18% of households that are $75,000, $200,000. Right, so 
Oh yeah, there. So we got about almost 90% going to the top, just the top 20% of income, right? So that's important to keep in mind here, right? These subsidies, you know, there's often a worry about carbon taxes being too regressive, about you know hurting poor people, right? We could address that by how we spend the money. So British Columbia put in a carbon tax. They use that then to cut tax rates for lower income families, right? To try to deal with the fact that that lower income people spend more of their money on gasoline, so they get hit by the carbon tax more. The subject is doing the opposite. It's basically it's a tax break going to the wealth to the wealthiest families. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's important to, to keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. <coughs> for energy R and D for the government investing in energy. What we like to do is you know, we want to have the government do things that the private sector would do on their own. So we want to invest in more basic research. Things are not yet close to market. So the MIT example about investing in, investing in a plant, the nuclear plant that's, that's reusing the nuclear waste, right? There is room for applied research as well, particularly when the applied research is things that firms aren't gonna be able to capture the benefits of on their own. So improving electricity transmission. Okay, the, the electricity grids all regulate. Right? You're not going to make you're not going to make a lot of money by coming up with a better way to transmit electricity. Energy storage. Right? These are things that would be game changers. Right? Yeah, you know, you're going to capture. This is what we call these knowledge spillovers. Right? Firm comes up with an idea. Other people build on that, and the firm really captures part of that benefit. So the example I always give my class, my teachers, is the iPhone. So Apple was the first to come up with a smartphone. They made a lot of money on that. But think about all the other products that build on that technology. You know, so other companies, Samsung came with their own, other companies came up, came up with their own phones. You know, Amazon had, you know, had, has the Echo now, so this thing at home where you can talk to Alexa and get out, you know, ask any question you want. Right? That's all building off that smartphone technology. All these other ideas that help so many people that Apple doesn't get a reward for. Mm -hmm. right? That's the idea of a knowledge spillover. People are building on each other's ideas. And so we want to be able to support that so we can get more of those ideas out there. So I put this up and want to... What are we actually doing? Well, actually, R &D, energy R&D in the U.S. is focused more on increasing energy supply rather than trying to develop clean technologies. So we've had a lot of work on trying, and actually a lot of the work, a lot of the research that was done on fracking in the 1970s, 1980s was led to the hydrofracking boom today. Um, energy security, low prices have been the goal. A lot of the work has, done, has been done is on nuclear, and it's still on nuclear. Um, so this is the Department of Energy's budget over each of the last 20 years. First thing to keep in mind, the Department of Energy is primarily a defense agency. Right? So you know, they talk about getting rid of it, they talk about, you know, we don't need it. It's not, I mean, it is not, it is, it is not really about clean energy. The orange here, this is atomic defense. It's a good chunk of the budget goes to atomic defense. Hmm. This is kind of general science R&D. Um, there's a board. Fossil, nuclear and fossil are these two here. Clean energy, so efficiency renewables is this little blue bar here. So not a lot of the research at the Department of Energy actually goes to clean technology right now. Yep. Was, you had a 2% uh, uh, number uh, when you began. Was that the 2% uh, centigrade? Two, two, oh, two, two degrees, two degrees, yeah. Was that the uh, goal to limit the increase in average temperatures over time to 2%? Mm -hmm. And over how much time? Uh, is that what we're. So it's two, yes. So, so, yeah, yeah. So, so it's so it's two degrees, not two degrees Celsius, not, not two percent, but it's it is two two degrees Celsius over pre-industrial temperatures. So over what the temperature was, the global temperature was before the industrial revolution. Um, we are at about I think at one point three, one point five right now. If I remember correctly, I'm not positive on that. Um, now, when I, that number is based, um, that's not doing economic analysis. That number. Purely comes out of the physical sciences. Um, part of it's political. Um, it's easier to say two rather than two point three or two point seven or something. Um, but it's really designed to avoid 
it's concerned about catastrophic impacts. You know, at what point when we see things like you know, the ice shelf in Greenland melting and raising sea level or something like that. Well, that's uh, an arbitrary number that somebody agreed or that the 2% was agreed upon as, a, as an objective it is agreed upon. It is a somewhat. It, yes, I think it is fair to say it is a somewhat arbitrary number. Um, I mean, the, and you'll in which you'll see. So, I mean, economists that look at this, you'll see some debate over this. There are people that say it's even be lower than, than two degrees Celsius because the catastrophic effect could be really could be really deadly. The others are saying we I mean, we go to three degrees Celsius and we should think more about adaptation, about ways to try to deal with the fact that, that the climate that the climate is hotter. So. There's not universal agreement that it has to be exactly two, but two has kind of been, it's been the target that's been set out. Yeah. I think I give you an idea, and you may use it. Okay. <laughs> I think that you can uh, write a paper and try to tell people that you don't agree two uh, two degree up. You should agree as a plus minus two degree Celsius. The reason is this: when the carbon dioxide form a barrier. In the sky, if the created two possibility, one is the when the sun shining to our earth, and we get stuck, so we can we were getting feel hot, so continue hot, so that means the growth temperature up. But by another way, when the, the carbon dioxide form a layer, and the sun cannot can come 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 through, then what happening? Then we feel cold. So that's reason when this this day on the April March or April sometimes, and sometimes we feel very very hot, and sometimes we feel I, I need a winter. Right. So in that situation, all this situation is a climate change is because it's, it should be up and down. Oh. So when they finding the margin, they should use a previous information for them like uh, today is the June seven. 200 years ago, average June 7, the temperature is 57 degrees. And we suppose it should not get 59 degrees or 55. Well, what's important is to distinguish between what's called between climate and weather. Yeah. So you talk about the day, the weather on June 7. Yeah, that, I, I, that, I, that's I, weather, I, right? And, and that, and that could, what's that's a two degree. Right. I mean, I so, so, so it's right. So it's really right. Yeah, so it's, it's really based on kind of average global temperatures, and what you'll see there's a lot of there's also a lot of regional variation in that. Right. There's a lot more warming, for example, at the poles than there than there than there is than there is the, the more modern latitudes. So the reason is because the, uh, the, the energy of the sun is depends on the black spot, the activity. So when the activity is a starting stop, and the sun starting to uh, slipping up. Mm -hmm. And our Earth, if we're getting a lot of carbon dioxide, and we were getting the problem is we go back to the glacier age. That's another difficulty part too. We won't even worry about the sea. So the sea level will be up because of the melt. But you think about another direction is that maybe the glacier age coming back when the when the, the solar energy is starting to not provide so much energy to us. So my, my understanding of that is that mo most of the research kind of argues against that. So, so that actually there was something that was a concern back in the 70s, and um, that most of the research, as the, as the technology, as the measurement technologies and stuff have gotten better, that's become less of a concern to scientists than, than, than the warming side, um, just because they've been able to measure, do more to kind of compare the carbon dioxide in, um, you know, so they look a lot, for example, the ice sheets and stuff, so they can see what they were like at, at, at different times. Um, so it certainly said that's been discussed. I think the focus has been more on the warm side. Um, but the part, but your point about uncertainty is really important. I mean, I'm an economist like to try to focus on that. That it's mm -hmm. everything has to be done with plus or minus something. We don't know exactly what we're what we're going to get. Um, and the, the general art, or the really the debate comes down to is is you think of this insurance. You know, how much are we willing to extra are we willing to pay as insurance against against really bad things happening? Um, and that's that's really that's really where I, you know. Where the two percent, the two degree goal, is really a number that's based kind of on assurance. You know that we're uncertain about those really big impacts, and because they can be really, really, really costly, we're tr trying to trying to avoid those. Okay. <laughs> Other point I want to make about government R and D is you, you need to be patient. 
for two reasons. One is these things take a long time. I have no idea how long it would have taken to develop that part, the nuclear plant at MIT, but I'm sure it took several years. I mean, these are big, long-term projects. But the other thing is some projects are going to fail. Right? So this is important. Yeah, one of the reasons we like government R&D is that the government's, government's got money. The go and what I mean by that is the government can diversify. <coughs> but if a project, if one project fails, the government doesn't go under. Right? In the private sector, I mean, for a small startup firm, your entire success or failure depends on when, whether your one idea works. So being able to diversify is important. So to give you an example, so I'll give you two examples. I'll give this one here and I'll do one that's been in the news. There was a study that reviewed the investments the Department of Energy made from 1978 to 2000. Most of them failed. But the ones that were so successful, were successful, were so successful that the, the net benefits of the entire investment portfolio were positive. Because the ones that hit were, were big winners. But, I mean, this is the same thing that IT companies do. I mean, Apple has lots of things that haven't worked, but they make a ton of money off the things they do. To give you another more recent example, it's been, there's been a lot of a lot of debate in the news, a lot of stories about Solyndra. Okay, so this, this, Solyndra was was an investment made. This, this was money to help commercialize products. Um, so the Department of Energy had, had a loan guarantee program. Um, this clean energy companies have a hard time raising capital, and so Solyndra was a company that went under. They didn't pay back their loans. But if you look at the program overall, the program overall made money for the government. More companies paid back their loans with interest than defaulted. Mm -hmm. right? And so this is the idea, and that it's easier for the government to be able to diversify and to bear those risks than it is for any one investor to do, to do so. Right? So it's important to keep in mind, because a lot of times in politics, you'll see the focus on the failure, but investment, particularly in, in research, is risky. Some things aren't going to work. Okay, now to the fun part. Let's get to the politics and talk about where we may be going down the road here. Mm -hmm. anyway. So the first thing I want to point out, I think this is the most important thing. Yeah. Coal is not going to make a comeback. Right? And there's, there's two things here. So one is that a lot of the job losses in coal have been due to automation. It's not been due to the changes in energy. But again, where have those changes been? So this is that graph I showed you before with the couple projections for the future. As we said, natural gas, there was natural gas increasing that drove coal down. That's where we were in 2016. So you've heard talking about the clean power plant. So this was the plan that was put in place with the Obama administration, the Trump administration wants to roll back. This is the Department of Energy's projections. If we have the clean power plant, natural gas goes up, coal continues to go down. If we take that away though, Natural gas prices are still cheaper. Natural gas is going to keep growing. I mean, it makes, it'll stop the decline, but coal's not coming back. Coal, stay, coal stays flat. This shows you what the cheapest type of plant to invest in in any county in the state. This was a study that was done by researchers at the University of Texas. Um, so the colors on here, so this for, I have there's two maps. So this first map is without including the social cost. So this is just based on the private cost for investors. The green areas are areas where wind is cheapest. We mentioned before, one of the challenges for wind is a lot of that's in the Midwest where it's not really close to population. A fair amount of areas in upstate where wind, where wind is cheapest. Wow. There are all the areas that, you know, if you're, if you're close to the lakes, uh, you've got lots of wind there, so wind is very cheap there as well. The Orange, a little bit of mine, that's the only, there are 20, 29 counties in Upper Minnesota and in Wisconsin where coal, is, where coal would be the cheapest. Again, this is without the externalities. There's some nuclear, the red is natural gas. So there's not a lot of places where coal is viable. That's without considering the cost of the pollution and so on. If we add in those social costs, the orange goes away completely. New York becomes pretty much all green now. We see more winds. You see wind going all the way down into, into Texas. A little more for nuclear, but still primarily natural gas. But, I mean, so in terms of fossil fuels, natural gas in the future. Renewables will eventually come on as the, as the costs go down, but coal, coal is not going to make a comeback. The other thing that's important for this, so this is just thinking about the cost. The policy uncertainty matters too. So you'll notice there was a, you know, there was a big negative response for a lot of industry 
after 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 Trump pulled out of the Paris, the Paris Agreement. Um, Exxon Mobil actually was one of the companies that tweeted out against it. Why are they doing this? They're doing this because they need to know what the investment climate is going to be like, not just for tomorrow, but for the next 20 years. Right? If, you're, if I'm building a power plant, I got to know what the regulations are going to be 20, 30 years down the future. Right? Or if policy is being made by executive order, every four years, the policy changes. I don't know what to do. I'm not going to invest in coal if I think that a Democrat's going to win in 2020 and change it, change it again. And I mean, really, I mean, unless Congress comes along and puts something in place that's going to stay in place, the investment climate is going to be too risky. And, and you know, I think a lot of firms would rather that there be climate policy made under a Republican administration have something in place, because they know. I mean, this is happening in every other country in the world. They have to develop their products for everywhere, so they're still focusing on these clean technologies. They'd rather the U.S. be part of it than not know what the investment climate is going to be five, ten years down the future. But, so that's important, right? I mean, unless there's a replacement to the clean power plant, you know, it's not just rolling it back. Because the idea that the U.S. is not going to have a climate policy ever for the next 30 years exactly. is not credible. No. Nobody believes that. So unless we put something in place to replace it, these companies aren't going to make big investments. There's too much uncertainty. Yeah. You saw that map. Future for wind still looks good. Mm -hmm. So I think I told the story before. So there's a utility in Texas that because the wind blows more at night, they offer their customers free electricity at night. If you wait to turn your dishwasher, your laundry on eight, nine o'clock, you can use electricity for free. Because we got so much wind, we don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Customers aren't going to give that up. That's a good deal. The other thing is that states are playing a leading role here. The policy for renewables is coming from states. It's not coming from the federal government. 29 states have policies that promote renewable energy. So all these states here, the dark blue ones have binding, have binding regulations. So New York's goal now, their most recent goal is 50% renewables by 2030. The blue states all have bonding regulations. The light blue are ones that have renewable goals, but it's not set in stone. There's no enforcement mechanism behind it. And you'll notice, this is not just the blue states, right? There's plenty of purple states. There's plenty of red states on here as well. But so a lot of the action for renewables is coming from the states rather than from the federal government. There's a little bit being done in climate change at the state level. California takes the lead here. So California passed a law in 2006 that was designed to reduce emissions to 1990 levels by 2020. So they're well on the way to that. They're talking about what the next, what the next level of regulation is going to be. Um, New York is one of the nine states that are part of the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, what's called REGI. Um, so the goal was to cap emissions that started in 2009, to cap emissions at the current levels, to reduce them by 10% by 2019. It hasn't really done anything. It hasn't really done, and emissions have gone down, but they've gone down because of natural gas and because the economy, particularly in 2010, struggled. And so they lower the cap a bit, but the prices for these are really low. Um, so this is the, the allowances that have been offered. They cut them back in 2014 to drive the price up. Price went up a little bit, but then when the clean power plan was suspended by the Supreme Court, the price went back down. These prices are about three or four dollars per ton of carbon dioxide. To put that in perspective, I mean that would increase the cost of gasoline by a couple cents. I mean it's not going to make a big impact on prices. Um, going back to those estimates of the, I show you how the the cost vary for the different power sources. The cost they use there for carbon is thirty-six dollars per ton. Is, is the damage being done? So this isn't even close to capturing capturing that. Right? So this policy really isn't really isn't doing that much. There are some concerns with leaving to the states. So one of the challenges of leaving to the states is what we call leakage. Right. So carbon emissions are a global pollutant. It doesn't matter whether it comes from New York, whether it comes from Pennsylvania, it comes from California or Nevada, whether it comes from China. Right. It still has the same impact on the global climate. What that means is that if one state has a policy and one state doesn't, so if California has really stringent regulations, right, more electricity is going to be generated in Nevada and just sent over the transmission lines to California. Or companies can move out and they can move to Oregon, they can move to Arizona. Right? To the extent that companies move because of that, even though it may look like they've reduced the emissions in the state, 
the impacts of the world is actually isn't any different. Right, so coordinated U.S. policy is better because it avoids that problem. Right? There still may be issues with, and this is one of the reasons we wanted a global climate treaty, because the concerns about, about coming to China, for example. But it's certainly a lot easier to move from New York to Pennsylvania than it is to move from New York to China. Right? So I think particularly important has some kind of coordinated policy within the U.S. I think the bigger concern is that funding for long-range R&D is in jeopardy. So the U.S. as a side negotiation of the Paris Agreement, there are 22 countries that were part of what's called Mission Innovation. So these countries pledged to double their energy R&D by 2020. Instead, the last the budget that came out from the Trump administration proposed an 18 percent cut in energy R&D, a 69 percent cut to the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. So clearly going in the wrong direction. This is one where it's made more difficult for states to pick up the slack. Right? This goes back into the idea of uncertainty and being able to diversify a portfolio, but also just coordination. Right? I mean, we want to have some coordination. It's easier to have the federal government deciding who's spending the money. If people in New York are making decisions, if people in California are making decisions, it's not going to be coordinated. Right? We don't want to be having two people basically working on the same project because it's one decision been made in Albany and one's been made in Sacramento. Right? So the more coordination we have on the R&D, the better. Right? There's been an effort of the private sector foundations to pick up the slack. Um, Bill Gates has proposed his breakthrough energy ventures. Um, they try to put some private money into that, and whether that'll be enough isn't clear. Um, but this is probably where the, the biggest impact is going to be is on kind of the funding for long-term things. And I think you know, even for wind, this is going to be an issue because, as we said, the challenge for wind now, the costs have gotten down. The challenge now is how to integrate these things into the grid. Can we develop storage? Can we come up with microgrid, different ways of managing the grid? Those are things where you know, fire aren't going to do as much of that on the realm where public sector investment is going to be important. Mm -hmm. right. So with that, thank you, and we'll open questions.